Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Computers are so complex these days. I'm sorry, so it took uh, a few minutes to set up everything. Anyway, um, the title of my talk is uh, Decompilers and Beyond. So we'll, I will talk about uh, decompilers and uh, more precisely about uh, the decompiler I built. Uh, it was available, so it's available since the last year, but uh, it took me uh, maybe five or more years to build it. Because it was not that something simple. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first question, uh, why do we need the compilers and uh, do we need them at all? Uh, because uh, the compiler is a big thing, it's a very complex uh, piece of software and this complexity must be justified. Maybe we can go uh, without the uh, decompilers and solve our problems without them. Then we'll switch to, uh, we'll discuss uh, a typical decompiler design, how to build decompilers, and in my opinion, there are some misconceptions how to do it. And I will just uh, show you how I do it, I build mine. And after that, of course, there will be some demos. Uh, there is no no question of making a presentation without a demo. A live demo, and I hope that uh, everything will go smoothly. And uh, after that, we will be in position to, to, to discuss uh, new tools and analysis that, uh, make, that uh, become uh, available because of the decompiler. So because we have a decompiler and we can use it to build something bigger, uh, more intelligent, more powerful on top of it. So that's our future uh, as I see it. And after that, if you have any free time, hope so, there will be some questions and everything like that. So the first question uh, about decompilers and if we need them at all. Uh, you all know that we use uh, these assemblers to analyze binary code. Uh, and uh, these assemblers are something quite simple. What they do, they take a binary file like PE file, MS-DOS executable, or just a stream of bytes, and they convert this stream of bytes into instructions. So it's very simple one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, I could say that a nice uh, simple disassembly can be written maybe within one or two days. It's a very simple task. You create a table and like, for example, 0x90, is, is mapped to no operation, no, nope, and so on, so on. So simple, uh, these assemblers, uh, they just produce a listing with instructions. But if you worked a little bit with the real world examples, real world programs, you understand that this is usually not enough and you need something bigger, something uh, better, more powerful. Uh, I hope that you heard about ID Pro and uh, you know that ID Pro can Annotate the listing. Uh, it has a very good navigation system. Uh, you know the difference between a good and bad disassembler, especially if you spend your time working with uh, trying to analyze programs, and uh, it's a very time consuming activity. All disassemblers, they have one inherent problem their output stays very, very low level. It's just an assembler listing. So what you have is just listing of instructions. And these instructions are kind of very small. And you know you have these CPU registers, memory cells, addresses. But you, as an analyst, you have to map these instructions into something high level. You have to give a meaning to these instructions. If you, have a poop, uh, if you have a push, then some instructions, and uh, you have a pop, the same register, let's say. Based on my experience, I, I would say, it looks like we are saving a register at the beginning, and we are restoring at the end, but I have to do it. A disassembler will never show me that, it, that this, is, uh, this is how we save a register and uh, restore registers. So what we do, the analyst, what it, he does, he mentally maps assembly instructions into higher level abstractions and concepts. At the beginning, it's a very difficult task. And uh, you can say that it's a very steep learning curve, and, and that's why anyone who can read assembly text 
is considered as being highly skilled uh, specialist, which is true. But on the other hand, it becomes a very boring task after a while because you know all this stuff. And it's always the same repeating, repeating, repeating. So in other words, I would say that the output is very boring and it's inhuman because humans are not very good with handling this repetitive code. Take uh, this listing on the right. You see that we take a byte and we put it into the output buffer. We take another byte, we copy it, and so on, so on, so on. You read this, and after while, you look at it, and you say, okay, I understand that we copy bytes here. But the, the amount of text to analyze is very big. Uh, you have an temptation to skip this and to say, okay, we just copy bytes here. But are you sure that we copy bytes? We don't swap them? You cannot be sure unless you read. You have to read that the first byte is copied to the first position in the output buffer. The second byte is copied to the second byte in the, uh, to the second position, and so on. If you miss something, your analysis will be wrong. So, at the same time, it's boring, but you must stay alert. You could, cannot say, ah, okay, it's this, I, co I collapse it into one line. By the way, it would be very nice to, to be able to collapse this into one line, uh, or even maybe two, three lines. Uh, by the way, in IDE you can do it, but uh, you have to do it manually. And uh, again, something that uh, you lose your time. If you take another sample, or oh, these two, two instructions on the left, um, okay, it's nothing, not, not rocket science. Look at this, you say, we take ECX, we take ECX multiplied by two, two plus one makes three. Okay, what do we do with that? What do, what do we do with that? We, we put it into ESI, and after we mul multiply it by two, by two, three multiplied by two makes six. Okay, so we take six, uh, we take ECX, multiply it by six, and add EX. You see that it takes time. It's much better to have one line like this, and you're done. And a decompiler could generate a code, code like that for us. So my opinion is, and it was like this since the beginning, we need decompilers. They are very helpful. Uh, I'm, so especially today, when we have megabytes, megabytes of code, and the listings are so huge, so nobody, no human being can analyze everything, all instructions, everything understands, so, uh, all antivirus companies, and uh, everyone who works with uh, reverse engineering seriously, they cannot analyze everything. So what they do, they just try to locate interesting parts of the code and uh, on, analyze only that, that. But even that is difficult because uh, even there you have a lot of code to analyze. So we need the compiler, but the question is why we don't have any? We don't have any nice, deca we, uh, nice decompiler, uh, not uh, before mine, I would say that, because I am proud of the decompiler, how it works. Uh, the reason is because it's a very, very tough uh, thing to do. First of all, I, could, uh, I can even say, just say, uh, you cannot build an ideal decompiler. If you want to have an ideal decompiler, something like you press a button and you have a nice everything, no. And mine, my decompiler is not like this nicer. It's not ideal. We cannot build an ideal decompiler. I will show you some examples so you will see why. On the other hand, it's very customary to compare compilers and decompilers. It's, it says that compilers have these steps. They preprocess, they perform lexical analysis, syntax analysis, code generation, optimization. And decompilers have more or less the same steps. We can uh, make it like this. Yes, this is true that this comparison is correct, but it's very, very superficial. In fact, if you delve into the details, you will see that nothing matches anymore, and things are very, very different. Let me show you just two samples, two uh, points. First of all, compilers are in very privileged position. They have very strictly defined input language. Anything wrong, anything something suspicious, they just print an error message and stop and their job is done. And uh, if you are a programmer, you go and uh, fix your source code. 
Compilers have a reasonable amount of information of all functions, variables, type information, everything. So they have plenty of information, they have very strictly input defined input language, and they generate, because of that, correct output. The output must be correct, yes. But it may be ugly. Nobody cares about it. Who will ever read it but us, some geeks? On the other hand, machine code decompilers, we are talking about native code decompilers, are kind of impossible because the input is informal. And more than that, it's even just plain hostile. Because sometimes your adversary is a human being that produces deliberately obfuscated code trying to make your life harder. Many decompilation problems are unsolved or proved to be unsolvable. So we are really in a hopeless situation. And the last point is that the output is examined in detail by a human being and anything that annoys him will be reported either as a bug either as a feature request or anything like that. Could you do it? Could you implement it better? So the conclusion is that uh, the robust compilers are just impossible. It's a reality, and I think that it's uh, the truth. But on the other hand, OK, we cannot do this. What about trying to uh, reach something to cover the most common cases and to, uh, to, generate, to create a tool that could handle at least, let's say, 90%, 80%, as much as we can. We know that the situation is hopeless, but we still try to handle it. That's, that's, I'm telling you how I was thinking about during all these years. I was first thinking, yes, it was a good idea. It's a good idea to have a decompiler on the hand. But I have this problem, I have that problem. What do, what do we do? Do we implement it? I don't know. And uh, well, when, while trying to build it, I was first I was trying to, that approach, one approach, another approach, and I found out that there's, uh, in many cases, there are very simple, naive solutions, but unfortunately, they don't work. In fact, uh, with binary analysis, it's always like that, I think, that if you work on the game, you, you know that anything that you can assume, any assumption can be proven wrong. Even if you say that if you have uh, a sequence of very nice instructions like move, add, and, and, and uh, ending with a nice return, you say, okay, I'm looking at this code, I, this code does this and that, you may be proven wrong because there may be an exception, for example, a deliberate exception in the middle of the uh, execution and the execution goes somewhere else. So what you see on the screen does not correspond what is, uh, to the reality. It's not always the case. And uh, if your adversary is a human being that, uh, who writes a deliberately obfuscated code, then you, might, you, might, you can be sure that there, some, there can be something unexpected, new trick, anything like that. So it's kind of an arms race. But anyway, uh, one thing is that if you have uh, a human being as an adversary, another thing, let's say, we don't have a human being as an adversary, so we make our task easier. We say that we will handle only compiler-generated code and nothing else. But even compiler-generated code poses lots of problems. Take function calls. When you look at the function call, you have to answer the following questions. You have to answer where this function expects its input registers, how it returns the result, if it spoils anything, registers, memory cells, if it changes the stack pointer, and does it return to the caller or somewhere else? You have to answer all these questions. And when you analyze the code, you always answer them like in your head. But it's very hard, difficult, very, very difficult to do, thing to do, and even more difficult to formalize. Take the example to the, on the left. We have a call, and it's indirect. So we don't know what we call. We have to do what, what, with what we have. We have only five instructions here. How, can you tell how many arguments this function expects and where they are? I cannot because it's very difficult. I can't guess what I can do. I can guess. And my educated guess, let's say, uh, I am sure that there are two arguments on the stack. And 